brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Today's Holy Scripture comes to us from the epistle of 1 Peter. This is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Hear these blessed words. Slaves, accept the authority of your masters with all deference, not only those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. For it is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. But if you endure what you are do when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For it is this that you have been called, because Christ has suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. When he entrusted himself to one who judges justly, he bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and his guardian for your souls. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, I need to give you a little bit of a content warning that we are going to be talking about things that very well may make you uncomfortable. And I ask that because we're in a virtual setting, you just don't go ahead and turn it off because I already said that. You see, in the lectionary text for this week, it begins at verse 19. And you might be hearing a lot of sermons about that this week, since it seems a lot of people jumped on the first Peter train, that they're going to start with saying, for it is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. That's great. As you go through the rest of the text, it's going to be the point of saying, be nice to one another. Just, just be nice. It doesn't matter what, what's happening in the world. Just be kind. And that's a beautiful, beautiful sermon. But we need to talk about an ugly truth that is inside of our churches and inside of the world around us. Not only as Methodists, but as Christians, as disciples of the living God, this is important. They leave out verse 18. Let me tell you this again. Actually, let's go up to 16, and then we'll go down. As servants of God, live as free people, yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Honor everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves, accept the authority of your masters with all deference, not only those who are kind and gentle, but to those who are harsh. Okay? For it is a credit to you, if being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. Do you see the word we're going to have to talk about today? Do you see the word that the world, even in our religious sphere, we kind of want to just go ahead and rush aside and pretend isn't something? The word is slavery. And we need to talk about this because in 2020, there are still slaves in the literal sense. I'm not even talking about, oh, well, we're all slaves of sin. We're all slaves of this and that. No, we have literal people in bondage. We have literal people in bondage in the United States of America. And it's important to remember that even though we are sitting here in comfort and sitting here in peace, not all people are given that luxury. And we as disciples are called to fight for freedom. We are called to remember the words of Paul, where there are no differences in God's kingdom. Is that not the case? We are called to remember that we are all God's people, and God paid the price so we may all be free and be free indeed. Not simply free of the sins of the world, but free through Christ Jesus, we are made equal, and there is no price on a human life greater than the price that Christ paid for each and every life on the cross. Let's take it a step back further. Let's talk about additional slavery in our world. We live in a world where many people are enslaved based on finances, where we live in a, in a week-to-week paycheck basis, where people are stuck in jobs, where they are be treated miserably, and there is no escape. We live in this, and we see it all, all throughout the world. I'd say in big cities, but it's even here in our beautiful little town. We live in a world where there is cyclical poverty and institutions that have been made forth in order to keep people oppressed and keep 
people living in this cycle of poverty and hurt and sorrow, while other people exploit and use those institutions for their own benefit. And let me be abundantly clear in saying this. If your gospel, the gospel that Christ tells us makes all people free, involves anything or anyone being enslaved, anyone or any person being exploited for your personal benefit, that is not the gospel. That is not the truth. And I highly recommend you examine your soul and determine what you must do. Because as Christians and as United Methodists, we are called to do good. We are called to cause no harm. And we are called to change the world by being living disciples of our living God. Now that's out of the way. Let's go ahead and talk about this text in the way that it's meant for the ancient readers. Because when we talk about slavery, and we don't like talking about slavery, we cannot be thinking of the 16th, 17th through 19th century American slavery system with the transatlantic slave trade. This is a different system. It's a system that is in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Is it terrible? Absolutely. But they are not intrinsically the same, especially to the people that Peter may be writing to who are part of the Roman Empire. You see, in the Roman Empire, about one in three people were enslaved. About 30% of the population was physically owned by somebody else. Again, let me make that clear. They are physically owned by somebody else. They cannot just go, they cannot leave, they cannot just go find a new home. They are sold and bothered as though they are trading cards, not true living human beings. And through all of this, the Roman tradition was that if you are the patriarch, if you are the father of your family, everybody does what you do. So if you'd go and you worship, I don't know, Mars, they would go and worship Mars. If you were a family of Jupiter or Minerva, that was your family's worship. And you would go with the father, with the owner, with the master, and you would go and pray and do whatever they did because what's good for you is good for the rest of the household. But you'll notice there's a little bit of friction happening here because the, the slaves that he is speaking to, the people who are oppressed, the people who are hurting and crying out, are thinking about violence. And first of all, let me be perfectly clear. Slavery is not justified. There is nothing that those people did to deserve bondage and deserve their human freedoms taken away. But they're sitting here wondering, what can we do? How can we be nice? How can we be kind to these people who are mean to us, who have taken away everything that we have, that have oppressed us? And 1 Peter, again, is a difficult text because God is not telling us to simply let people walk over us. I think about this a lot when we talk about turning the other cheek, right? That's not Christ telling us to just simply submit and let people do whatever they want to do and do whatever they're going to do to you because that's just, that's just the godly way, isn't it? It's not the godly way. We are called to show love and mercy despite what others do do to us. We have a choice, and the choice that they're talking about in here, about doing wrong when wrong is presented to us, let's be abundantly clear here, is biblical. Do you guys know the phrase, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? That's biblical. It's this idea of retaliation, but measured retaliation. For example, if somebody takes your hand, you can't take their whole arm. That is not justified retaliation. That is not a fair exchange for returning what has gone wrong. But we're not talking about that. What we're talking about here today is what we can do as disciples living in a world of oppression, living in a world of pain, a world of grief, and a world where people are still enslaved, whether it is physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, there are people still enslaved, and what can we do to break that cycle? The same thing that Jesus the Christ did for us. Share in love. Stand up to those who are oppressing others. And especially as the community of Christ, 
We are called to correct one another with love and mercy. Let's go ahead and go back to what Peter tells us in the scripture. For what credit is you, for, in verse 19, for what is a credit to you if being aware of God you endure pain while suffering unjustly? If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure and do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you may follow his steps. Let's break this down from three weeks ago. This first section we talked about. God gives us an abundant, indescribable joy. And we need to remember that joy. God has called us to be living creations, to be remade and be called holy, to be set apart and be examples for the world. The beginning of, of chapter 2. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice, all guile, and sincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that you may grow into salvation. If it is indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourself be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood and to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. So you see, we can't pull our scripture out of context. We can't just cherry pick whatever we want and say, that's what the Bible says and that's what it means. We are called to be kind and show love to people even when they will not do the same for us. We are called to remind them of a living and true God that despite persecution, despite harm, despite pain, despite death on a cross, and despite being thrown in a tomb, we show love and mercy. And we show those people this because there is another way, another truth, and another life. And that is through the sacrifice of our Lord Christ Jesus. I want to talk about this just a little bit longer because it's extremely important. This idea of what can we do if it seems like there's nothing to do at all. First of all, let's go back to 2 Peter 6 that I just read. We as a community in Christ have the obligation to work towards the freedom, the love, and the forgiveness of all peoples through our Lord Christ Jesus. We are called my blessed friends, to make a difference. And you may be thinking, oh, well, there's no difference that we can make. That's a lie. That is an abundant lie, and I hope that you can get that out of your mind when you are thinking about what God does. Because again, God does not think on the same mind points that we do. God thinks in the heavenly realms. And he tells us this, that we do not think his ways, and we do not think his ways. So maybe it's time for a perspective change. Maybe it's time to look at this beyond simply, oh, well, you know, my brother doesn't treat me very nice. Or maybe, you know, my coworkers, they're mean to me. Yes, the scripture can be used for those examples, but let's go deeper. Let's go further and look to the people that we call essential workers. And again, God bless each and every one of you, you are in my prayers each and every day and every night. And if I can do anything for our essential workers, please let me know. Because I know the truth. That when we look at our essential workers two months ago, nobody would have given a second thought to them. To our cashiers, to our first responders, to our nursing and doctor staff. They are under such an immense pressure right now. I hope that you are able to find relief. And what can we do as disciples? Show love. Show mercy. Show them that there is a difference that can and will happen through the blood of Christ Jesus. We know for a fact that Christians can make a difference. We know for a fact we've seen it through history time and time again, my holy friends. This is our chance to look at a people that are oppressed. And I'm sorry if I'm hurting any essential workers' feelings, but in my personal view, 
I may want to get out of the pulpit to talk about this, but in my personal view, you are oppressed. You are being held down. You are being exploited. And as disciples in Christ Jesus, all I can ask of you is to continue sharing love and mercy. Continue doing the very best you can and let us do as we can. I think it is time for us to look at the people who are marginalized in our world, the people that we are willing to sacrifice in order to keep an economy running in a post-scarcity economy. I think we need to look as Peter does and as Jesus does and as, as Paul does to recognize not what makes us different, but what makes us the same. My holy friends, how blessed is this day that we can come together as Holy Communion and commit ourselves. Once we can have this holy, blessed meal, we can commit to the Lord God on high, the creator of all things. We're ready to change. That we are equal. That we, there are no differences in God's kingdom. We stand united. Not just as United Methodists, but as brothers and sisters of the living God. May the Lord's supper, may his bread, his body that was broken for us, give us salvation for our future. May the blood that was shed for us remind us of the luxury that God wishes for all of us to have. And may we, as living stones and a living priesthood, share in that message, to share in that love, and to share in that responsibility that we are not alone even for those who seem to be enslaved by the system, they are not alone. We stand with them. We stand with those who are exploited. We stand with those who are broken and say you are not alone. We are with you and we will fight. We will change. We will show the world the face of Christ Jesus and all that we do and all that we have. My friends, as the Apostle Peter tells us, let us be living examples. Let us not simply talk the talk and say, yes, I'm a Christian, I love Christ. Show the love of Christ. Show it to those who you know personally. Show it to those that you will only meet in paradise. Share the face and love of Christ Jesus with everyone that you know and everyone that you will meet because it's, great. it's so important right now to remember that simple truth. Christ has died for all peoples. Christ is risen and Christ will come again. And we get to be his hands, his feet, his mouthpiece, and his voice during this blessed time. Amidst the panic and confusion and hurt, look to the shepherd. Let us lead others to the shepherd and let us show the world what the shepherd can do. Let us make a difference for those making a difference now and will probably never see anything come out of it. It is time for us to remember that when we return to these pews, when we return out to the world on June 10th, we can make a difference. We can look at what the world has tried to make and we can be living examples to remember what Christ has said for us. That no life has a price greater than the blood shed for it. We get the, to remind our world that we are living people. We are exiles of this world. So when the world reemerges and reawakens and wants us to fall back into the cycle of wage oppression, when it falls back into the cycle of consumerism, commerciality, let us stand together and stand united for the benefit of not just ourselves, but the entire world, regardless of what they think, regardless of what they believe, regardless of what they see in us. Let us show them what we see in them through our Savior, Jesus the Christ. World without end. Amen and amen.